Louis-Auguste Blanqui was born in 1805 and was a revolutionist at heart. Preferring uprisings before general elections, he was a dangerous thinker in a system and a time where societal changes were either so slow that even the most patient observer couldn't witness the development, or so disruptive that it turned the whole hierarchic system upside down. Blanqui was an armed thinker. His thoughts were actions that were not meant to contemplate on, but to react to. It is no wonder that he was sent to jail as a notorious recidivist of the spirit. One of his first convictions was a lifelong sentence. In jail he became critically ill, upon which he was liberated to die on his own expense. But instead of dying, he stood from his deathbed three years later to continue his political actions. After many travels, agitations, convictions and releases, he ended up in Brussels, where we are now, to attend the Congress of the International Working Men's Association, also known as the First International, where he would play an important role in the development of an organization of workers and the foundation of international trade unions. This European project would lead to the irresistible uprisings, constructing a non-hierarchical and worker-led structure, where land, housing and production equipment would be collective property. The vices and the profits of cooperative organization would be shared by the collective. Blanqui became impatient, very impatient indeed, and attempted a coup after which he was incarcerated again and was sentenced to death for a second time in his life. Soon after, hundreds of Parisians declared the Commune and they needed Louis-Auguste Blanqui. They proposed exchanging several prisoners to free him, but the French government refused. Only sparse messages from the self-organized commune were transmitted to the outside world. Everything was put in force to contain this infectious movement of communism. It had to be violently repressed before it would spill over to other cities. But what was this moment in history again? I quote, on March 18, in the year 1871, during the last days of the Franco-Prussian War, while Parisians were enduring massive unemployment and the effects of the Prussian siege of Paris, the left-leaning Paris National Guard revolted, took over the town halls of most of the districts of Paris. Women in the district persuaded the government soldiers not to fire on Parisians, and their appeal helped spark the insurrection. Thiers and his government fled to Versailles to join the recently elected monarchists of the National Assembly. They became known as the Versaillais. A week later, the National Guard held new municipal elections and the socialist anarchist commune was installed at the Hotel de Ville. It introduced radical social reforms while fending off the advancing Versailles. The reforms included setting up a new educational system that separated church and state, instituting professional education for women, giving pensions to unmarried women, suspending or cancelling many debts, establishing unemployment exchanges, abolishing night work for bakers, and allowing trade unions and workers' cooperations to take over abandoned factories. Within two months, the Versailles had amassed an army of 300,000 soldiers, which re-entered Paris on May 21, plowing through the Communard street barricades and massacring between 20,000 and 30,000 Parisians over the course of one week. End quote by Jonathan Rosenbaum, film critic. 
Why does a film critic write about the Commune of Paris? Because a film was made about it. A monumental film with a runtime of more than five hours. The English filmmaker Peter Watkins brought to life a hypothetical television crew reporting on the day-to-day -day developments within the commune. He asked himself what would happen if the commune had been covered by audiovisual media. What would be communicated to the outside world? And more importantly, how would the common arts express themselves? To answer this question, he turned to the communities of Paris. More than 200 people were engaged in a collective re-enactment. People from the working class and immigrants were to play the commune arts, and the Versailles were played by people from the conservative press and right-leaning Parisians. Moi, je suis le grand père Thibaudier, mais je suis un communard, hein? à fond, à fond. Moi, je suis pas une bourgeoise. Moi, je suis une ouvrière. Alors, il y a les bourgeois, les gars nationaux, les Versaillais, les Versaillaises, les Arphelines, les femmes du peuple, l'UDF, le, euh, le club des femmes, les, les gars de la rue, les pauvres. They were divided in working groups. They would read about the historical background and engage in daily discussions on topics related to the commune. Filmmaker Jeff Bowie made an extended making of of this film, called The Universal Clock, in which we see the struggle of Watkins, who conceived the commune as a television film, but who sees himself confronted with an image culture hostile to his work. But why does this film has no place in the medium of television? Today, the media landscape is scattered into individual feeds, big data-driven personal selections and on-demand content. We have moved away from the old-fashioned mass media into an atomized spectatorship. At the turn of the millennium, Peter Watkins was fighting to regain the territory of mass media. But why? He did this, possibly, because Watkins believes sharing a big audience creates a momentum in time, when people can discuss what they have seen, engage in dialogue in a shared public sphere. The fact that this transmitted simultaneously creates the possibility for public debate and political impact. Mass media institutions that are open to heterogeneous content have the capacity to nurture a cultural community, a global village open to all voices and in proximity of everyone. A cultural sphere which center is everywhere and which boundaries are nowhere. But, and I quote Peter Watkins, the aim of the mass audiovisual media is to create a non-stop stream of impact points, surprises, as one filmmaker called them, that will prevent viewers from being bored and, crucially important, from experiencing a variety of reactions, let alone have time to reflect upon or query what is entering their subconscious. Ask a director of the National Geographic and he will acknowledge the mass media adhere to a standardized form in which there is no place for a personal perspective. There are filmmakers who quite justifiably say this is my work and I want it to stay the way it is. That's their right and, um, and we respect that. Uh, those are the films we don't buy and those are the films we don't transmit. But there are different options, according to Watkins. He writes, If, for example, I am at a public meeting and I have a message to pass to someone in the audience facing me, I do have choices. I can speak directly from the platform. 
Or I can write the message on a piece of paper, put it into a steel film can and hurl it at the victim. Conversely, I can sit beside the person and quietly give him or her the same message. Even better, I can engage in a dialogue. Each method delivers the message, but each method has a different meaning for the participant who receives and accepts said message. And yes, there has been a choice. In 1879, Blanqui was elected for the parliament, but he couldn't join the government since he had to stay in his prison cell. In his life, he was imprisoned more than nine times. He was sentenced to death two times and received another two times lifelong imprisonment. That the juridical system attributed him so many years makes his life essentially endless. But now, in the year 1879, the world of political action and the sweat and heat of the battle is replaced by the silence of four walls. Physical heraldry is contained in this ultimate private space. Blanqui becomes solely one body in a room, one eye in front of a window, one brain in front of the stars beyond. The universe is out of his reach, imperturbable by his speeches. But in the total indifference for human struggle and suffering, strangely enough, he finds solace. He realizes that no matter the outcome of his lifelong struggle, whether he would fail or prevail, those stars he sees outside his window will be there, forever. Time then becomes something different than the space between the dry bread of the morning and the dry bread of the evening. It becomes charged with eternity. He starts writing a book and calls it Eternity by the Stars. He repeats after Pascal, the universe is a sphere whose center is everywhere and its surface nowhere. He writes, as a whole and as well in detail, the universe is in forever transformation and imminence. Blanqui's verdict is that a human understanding of a god is an understanding that conceives worlds in the strong sense of the word. And his telling the world is the same as the world it tells. In his cell, Blanqui creates a sense of understanding all on his own. He realizes he can create a reality in which there are no borders and no limits to his own mind. What goes for the concept of a god goes for the stars and it goes for revolutions. This idea he shares with Peter Watkins, who also believes in the capacity of a telling of the world that conceives worlds. In trying to understand the reality of the commune, a community of people is conceiving new ways of creating democratic structures that challenge dominant oppressive powers. The way we tell the world is the way we create it. This is why Watkins will invite us to continue the fight against the TV executives of the monoform. Because we need diverse stories, many different eyes that look beyond their own windows of prisons, of bedrooms and of schools. Whatever we see, we influence and shape by the way we put it into words, into gestures, collectives paintings, shots, sounds, discussions.